Hello, I'm Minister Detina Hurd bringing you the next in a series of lessons from our Sunday School book called Bridges, Connecting God's Word to Life. It's the Sunday School book that we use at Solid Foundation Church of God located at 4201 Bank Street in Louisville, Kentucky, where the pastor is Peggy Neblett and I'm the associate pastor, Minister Detina Hurd. Even though our church has been opened for abbreviated services, we are continuing to record the Sunday School lessons for the time being. If you have missed any of them, you can go to our Facebook pages, Solid Foundation Bible Study and Discussion Group, Minister Detina or Detina Heard, or Pastor Detina Meditating Life Center. Or you can go to our YouTube channel, which would probably be great if you want to put the lessons and sermons and things on autoplay while you clean or want to play it for your family or something like that. But my YouTube channel is Minister Detina. So as we get ready to start this new unit and you get your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 11 and I will lead us in a word of prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we just thank you for another day that you have made. We are rejoicing and we are glad about it, Lord. There are so many who wish they could be here on this day and they have not, they did not live to see it, Lord Jesus. There are people who are mourning and grieving their passing, Lord, but we know that there is something greater in you, Lord. So we have joy in our sorrows and we lift up those who grieve and we grieve with them and we pray for the comfort that you have comforted us with, Lord, and that we remember to provide comfort to one another and show love for one another, Lord, as we go through the, the vestiges of life and the things that we have to go through, Lord being human beings on this realm. And so we just thank you because you're worthy, you're holy, you're good, you're loving, you're merciful, you're forgiving. We just bless you, God, in spite of our troubles. We thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and your mercy towards us, even when we don't seem to be worthy of it or deserve it. Thank you for your blood and for your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. And now we lift up any of those who are suffering in any area of their lives, Jesus, whether it's mentally, physically, spiritually, or emotionally. Right now, in the name of Jesus, by the power of Jehovah Rapha, our healer, we just ask for healing for them. For any of us, Lord, where we fall short, where we are lacking anything that's not like you, remove it. We give you permission today, God. Touch our bodies, Lord. Heal our bodies. Heal our minds. Heal our spirits. Heal, heal our souls, Lord. And, and bless us, Lord. Help us to go out and teach a word to each other, Lord, and speak your word to each other so that we may be healed. To seek your word and seek your promises so that we may be healed. And we just thank you for your precious promises and for your healing and for your comfort and for the encouragers that you send our way that will remind us of what you've said, to remind us what we've already been through to remind us that we still have the power of God dwelling within the believer and available to anyone who confesses Christ as their Lord and Savior on this day. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for making that available, that power, that peace. We just thank you, Lord, for peace that we that surpasses all understanding in Christ Jesus, Lord. So you tell us to not even be anxious for anything so because you know we'll be concerned and you know that fear has been trying to rule the land. But right now, in the name of Jesus, we just strike it down and just hold on to the fear of God because the fear of God lets us know that you are in control that you have all the power, that you will get the glory. And so we praise your holy name and we still have joy and we still find things to be happy about and we still love one another and we still forgive one another. Lord, we lift up the leaders, we lift up the law enforcement, we lift up the, the public figures, we pick, lift up the politicians, we lift up the protesters, we lift up everyone today, right before you, Lord, I just see us all floating right up under your holy, mighty hand, God, and right now, in the name of Jesus, we ask for your protection and your peace and your wisdom, God, and your justice, let it flow like a mighty stream, we love you, God, Lord, just let it work like it's supposed to, Lord, protect those that need protection, Lord Jesus, send your angels to intervene, to stand in the middle with their mighty swords of justice, Lord Jesus, that none be lost. Lord, that wisdom rules and reigns, Lord, that truth prevails on this day and every day in the name of Jesus, God, over all these circumstances, Lord, that we're going through all at the same time, Lord, this perfect storm of things that are seemingly wrong. But Lord, don't let us forget what's right, Lord Jesus, about this 
this life that you've given us, what's right about your word, what's right about you, God, that at the end of the day, we get victory in Jesus. We have that mental victory. We have the spiritual victory that we can just keep on going. People won't even understand how we're still laughing and smiling, even in painful days or grieving or mourning or disappointments because we know that we trust you, God, today. And we pray for, for our faith to be increased in these trying times, Lord, because in your word, you already said that trying times were going to come and times will get worse, but you didn't say that good times would be taken away. So we praise you, God, and we lift up our families and our marriages and our children children, Lord, those that are married, those who have children at home, and even our adult children, Lord, who sometimes it feels like we worry more once they have their freedom to be able to make choices and decisions, but Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, we pray for godly confidence that we've taught them right. We pray for godly confidence that they are in your hand. We pray for godly confidence that they find joy and that the small children still have childhood and good times and happiness and freedom from a lot of worry or responsibilities. Lord, as they they grow and mature and you that they get leadership skills and co godly confidence in who they are in your sight God and your protection your peace your success we thank you in advance Lord for the promises for our ancestors for the ancestors of those who serve you because you are mighty to save and so we know that our our children will be saved they will serve you and they're under your protection and under your peace and under your blessings Lord we just glorify you today God we believe you right now God, I can see it right now. I just see your anointing just flowing throughout the land in spite of circumstances from all the way to the top to the bottom. You're no respecter of persons, Lord. Your will is going to be done. And so you are all the people are joining together to pray, Lord, for your protection, for your peace, for your righteousness, for your justice, for your holiness for your joy and so it shall be done thank you god thank you lord we lift up those who are struggling financially lord help us to be good stewards of what you've already given us god and if there's some way that we need to change then help us to change our spending habits and our giving habits but other than that lord you are jehovah jireh you are our provider you have promised that we will not be without what we need and so we thank you lord for the hands and feet that you are using and the wisdom that you're using right here today, every day to make sure that we are fed, that we are clothed, that we're not forsaken and our seed is not begging for bread, that we are the ones who can go out and be the lender and not have to always be the borrower. We thank you, God, for your word. And we thank you for the encouragers, for the ones who pray and take time out of their days, Lord, to give us devotionals and lessons, to remind us of your word, to go out and touch people, people who work even in those fields, like the hospital workers, or the, even the sanitation workers who take away our trash, everybody who's still out here on the job. Thank you, Jesus. Bless them in a mighty way, God. Let them know you and, and, be, and understand what a great thing it is to be of service to God's people. And Lord, as these lessons go forth, Lord, let them do what you intend them to do. Lord, let wisdom rule and reign. Lord, we thank you for the lessons on justice and, and righteousness, Lord. And we thank you for these lessons on wisdom. And we know lives will be changed, Lord. And we are all made better for it. In Jesus' name we pray, thanking you. Amen. Our lesson this week is called Wisdom's Vindication. Wisdom's Vindication. It says, what is our study about today? People often label unusual or unexpected behavior as eccentric, foolish, or even wrong. In Matthew, Jesus said that his behavior and John's, while unusual in their day, would eventually be proven wise. The goals of the session are, are number one, to explain how the actions of Jesus and John the Baptist, while deemed unexpected or foolish, ultimately displayed divine wisdom. Our second goal of the session is to feel encouraged to behave in ways contrary to the expected in order to follow Jesus. And our third goal of this session is to review our own behavior to determine whether it reflects godly wisdom and make improvements where necessary. So basically it's saying that sometimes we're going to do things that we feel led of God to do or that are directly coming from his word. And some people will find those things to be strange or unusual, like when, you know, the last sermon from last week when we were talking about how God could have just, you know, taken the Israelite Hebrews, whatever, out of Egypt, 
but he had a way that he wanted to do it. So we had all these, they had all the plagues and all these different things that came about and he didn't even take them in a direct route once they got out of there because he knew they weren't ready for war. And so that's what will happen for us sometimes. We will do things in an unexpected way. You know, God made us all individuals. He wants unity, not uniformity, right? He wants us all to understand and be on one page uh, where it comes to him in Christ. But we're not, the way we do things is not going to always be the same. Our personalities are not the same. Our righteousness would be the same, right? Because we all stand on Jesus Christ as our source of righteousness. But people, so some people will say, oh, you're weird or you're strange or why would you do it that way? But as long as you know that that's what God is saying to you, you know that you're on the right track and that he will correct us when we're on the wrong track. Then we continue that way because we know in the end of the day, at the end of the day, then God will show us to be right. He will vindicate us that it was something that he had us to do. But in the midst of it, we still examine ourselves to make sure that, you know, especially if we're doing something that's, you know, usually going to be different or you know, strange that we examine to make sure that it is of God, right? It says to make improvements where necessary. So we can use godly wisdom. And then if we're feeling like we're on the wrong track or the way that we do, we're doing it needs to be tweaked or changed, then that's what we do. Our Bible passage is Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 through 19. What topics will be discussed? John the Baptist, service, True wisdom and human expectations. Our Bible background reads as such. John the Baptist has sent his disciples to find out if Jesus was the Messiah they had been anticipating. This seems a strange question in light of the Baptist's intervention with Jesus in Matthew 3. Jesus reassured his questioners and as they were leaving, he turned the topic to a discussion of the kingdom of God. There seemed to be a touch of humor in Jesus' description of John the Baptist. But Jesus elevated John as, quote, more than a prophet, at verse 9, indicating John's location in salvation history. He is the end-time messenger who fulfills the prophecy of Malachi, chapter 3, verse 1. After the appearance of this messenger, the Lord would appear. Wisdom in the kingdom of God often seems to be upside down by worldly standards. How could the eccentric John be greater than anyone who had been born before him? And how could those who entered the kingdom be even greater than John? The point is surely that in the coming kingdom of God, the little ones who believe in Jesus will be of equal standing with such important witnesses as John. What sort of violence had been assaulting the kingdom of God? The context of Matthew seems to suggest that it was the persecution of the prophets, including John and Jesus, who announced that this kingdom had come. There is strong resistance to the word of God when that word upsets the status quo of people's lives and the possessions and methods upon which they have based their security. The passage concludes with Jesus making an astute observation about the way people had applied wisdom in their assessment of John and him. People had accused John of being demon-possessed because of his failure to eat much then they criticized Jesus for his enjoyment of sharing the table with others. Were the people right in their assessment? Jesus said that wisdom would have its day. The truth would ultimately become clear. So he's saying that, you know, even though John is great, he's a great prophet. He's the forerunner to the Messiah. Once the kingdom comes, once everyone can receive the Holy Spirit living right inside of us, then we have way more power available. And so Jesus said we would do be able to do even greater things than people did in, like John in the Old Testament, although he is to be respected as great and a great prophet. We have the capability of doing even greater things in God, with God living inside of us, dwelling among us. And when it talks about what sort of violence, there are two interpretations. Um, one is the one in our book where, you know, there's one that, that's not in our book where that uh, some scholars say that the, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence or the kingdom of God suffereth violence and the violence taken by force. They say that means that people are going to be just running to be saved. They're going to be doing anything they have to do to be part, part of the kingdom, just like the friends who uh, lowered their friend through the roof to be able to get near Jesus. So they're going to be like running to get the word into enter the kingdom of God and live a godly life, you know, full of the promises of God, kingdom living. 
But the other interpretation is the one that we have in this book where it talks about people don't want to hear the truth a lot, a lot of times. That, you know, we have made up our minds and stand on certain beliefs, and we're seeing that in action today as part of protesting and part of, you know, antagonistic responses to protests and things, you know, and people's disagreements. And some of them are violent, you know, on both sides of it. And so, so if it's a purpose that is of God, which he hates injustice, and people are saying we're going to fight for justice, then other people will come against that. Amen. It's coming against the the wish, the the fulfillment of the kingdom of what God would want to happen, which would be justice. And sometimes it's going to get violent. You know, people when God says love someone, then someone can still stand on your neck and kill you. you know, when God says love, we have to love each other. You, people can still stand on someone's neck and kill them. Someone can still shoot them because they are influenced by their evil desires or immaturity or even the evil one, the devil, to do things that go directly against the word of God. And then other people will rise up. The kingdom will rise up against injustice. And then still violence will come. People will begin to speak words from their mouths. We go back and look at our other lessons in the last sermon um, from our church. And it would, we were led to talk about, you know, the kind of things that people are saying coming against the kingdom, which the kingdom is for justice. But people are saying if someone was to protest that, then they should die. They should go to prison. They should go to jail, that they are lying, you know, and things like that. So we have to just continue to prayer, right? Because of this violence and to stand up if God sends you out, to protest or if you are in a position of power or even amongst our friends, right, that we correct, you know, misunderstandings or um, things that are untrue. You know, I've seen a lot of untruths. People are saying that their opinion is the truth. They're changing history. Amen. And none of us knows everything. But there's a such thing as researching. Uh, for, definitely for such a time as this, we can Google, you know, we can pull out books and dictionaries and encyclopedias. We can kind of clear the cobwebs off of our history from high school and remember about things, you know, like the slavery or like, you know, freedom and emancipation proclamation or voting rights or any of the things that come up, you know, today and what are the rules about protesting and what is a police officer's job or what is a governor's job, mayor, president. And then we can also use wisdom in all of that to say, what did, would God want? us to look like? What would he want this world to look like? What does he want leadership to look like? What is it that he, what behavior is he expecting from us? Would he expect violent reactions to truth? Would he expect violent reactions to righteousness? No, we have, and so when we have those reactions and those anger, that anger rises up in us, we need to go back and pray, remember the word, and study to show ourselves approved, to know what we're talking about and taking the appropriate actions. Amen. Amen. So, and then it said it concludes with Jesus telling us, hey, wisdom is going to be proven by what, what happens. The truth is going to win in the end. It doesn't matter if we want to hold on to our biases, our prejudices, our power, our perceived power, our name or whatever, because we don't want to admit the things that we've done wrong or, you know, our people in leadership or, you know, even in a whole nation. But at the end of the day, the truth is going to win out. That's what Jesus said. So you can call people whatever you want, but the truth, God's truth is going to win out. Our Connect says, One church lifts worship to the Lord each Sunday morning with its historic and stately pipe organ, accompanied by a full choir. Another has drums, electronic keyboards, and multiple guitars that combine together for an energizing worship set. In one church, the people of the congregation enter the room in reflective silence. In another, there is lively conversation and fellowship before the service begins. In one church, the pastor shares from an assigned Bible text each week. In another church, the pastor chooses a text after seeking the Spirit's leading. I think everybody should do that, though. One church takes mission trips overseas each year. Another one serves at a local soup kitchen each month. One church has thousands of people in attendance each week and multiple pastors on staff. Another church has fewer than 10 people in worship and just one pastor who is a volunteer. One church meets in a 100-year-old brick building with lots of stained glass and dark wood pews. Another sets up chairs each week in the cafeteria of the local high school. A wise man of God once said, 
I believe God is at work in churches of all sizes and types. Do you agree with this statement? How have you seen God work in large churches, in small churches, in your own church? What different methods have you seen for sharing the good news of new life in Christ? How have you seen a church or another ministry think outside the box or use unconventional methods to have a significant impact for the kingdom of God? And, you know, sometimes people, you know, they do want to put a lot of rules on people and a lot of rules on worship, you know, almost pharisaical, you know, if you can't wear this and you can't sing this and you can't play an instrument and you can't, you know, and all these things. But, you know, our lesson is reminding us that God will do the things the way that he wants them done. Our The way that you check is to make sure it doesn't go against the word. Now, of course, there are different discrepancies in people's interpretation of the word. And then Paul tells us, hey, let your conscience be your guide. You know, that, that we learned that in Romans at our church. You know, I think it was Romans 14, um, chapter 14, I believe, is where he's saying, like, if a person really truly believes that what the way that they're doing things is of God and the Bible does not go against that thing, you can't show us where the Bible says, thou shall not play a guitar okay, or the Bible doesn't say thou shalt have to wear a suit, okay, then leave people alone. You you can say what you see to be wrong, you know, that you feel like you need to say those things because the Bible tells us if we have ought to go talk to the person, but ultimately, unless it's illegal, um, it's going to, it's up to God to change the person's heart. So we don't have arguments and, and hatred and, you know, and all these kind of things, dissensions among the body of Christ or with anybody, really just simply about things that are arguable. So we let people praise, praise him, praise his holy name, praise him with the drums, praise him without the drums, but just praise his holy name and work, learn of him, learn of him. Amen. So that was our connect. It's, it was talking about a variety of factors uh, in the way that churches operate is numerous, but most of these churches are sincerely seeking to facilitate worship of God and the teaching of God's word. Okay, so now we go to our study, and it's Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 through 8, affirming John the Baptist. The King James Version says, And as they departed, and this is after the people who have left, John's disciples have left. Remember at the beginning, uh, John's disciples have come to question, to, is Jesus the one, or should they be waiting for some, someone else? You know, cause sometimes you get like that, don't you? You go like, I believe I'm on the right track, but it doesn't seem to be happening as fast as I thought it would or the way that I thought it would or this person doesn't, you know, seem to be uh, what I thought they would be, This, you know, my boss or my leader or, you know, sometimes you just question and there's nothing wrong with questioning. You know, you just don't doubt for no for no reason. So you believe one thing and then act another way. But we can, some, we can question God. God, is it you? Lord, I want to be on the right track. God, please, you know, can you just let me know that I'm on the right track? Give me faith, you know, help increase my faith. You know, have my um, belief. So sometimes we might ask questions when we're not sure. So so John's disciples have come and asked Jesus, and Jesus said, Look, what happened? Go back and tell John you know, what you've seen. The blind see, the lame walk, you know, and, and the dumb speak. And that's from Isaiah 35, because it says that when the Messiah comes, those are the things he's going to be able to do. And those are the things that Jesus has done. And so a lot of times in the Bible, you will see when people ask Jesus questions, he's going to speak prophetic word to test you to see. At least test them to see if they really are of God. <coughs> Excuse me, because people should have known the prophecy and therefore they would have known God when he came. They would have known the Messiah if they would have referred back to prophecy and got past their own self-interest and their own doubts and their own biases. Doesn't that sound familiar to today? You know, if you just get past your biases, you can stand on the truth. You don't have to be afraid of the truth and then we can work everything out. If we, but we have to start with the truth of the matter. Amen. So it says, and as they departed, the John's disciples departed, to go back to John the Baptist, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. So after John the Baptist had been imprisoned by Herod, that's in Matthew 14, he began to wonder a bit about Jesus. The Gospels all state that John had already confirmed Jesus' identity at Jesus' baptism. That's in Matthew 3, 13 through 17, Mark 1, 1 through 8, 
Luke 3, 21 through 22, and John 1, 29 through 34. So why the apparent doubts now? John had been locked up for doing what God had called him to do. He did not necessarily want to find an easy way out of his persecution, but perhaps he did want to be sure that he was on the right track and had not misunderstood his calling. Jesus confirmed to John's disciples that Jesus had been doing God's work as the Messiah, same thing I was talking about, healing the sick, raising the dead, and proclaiming the good news of God's kingdom. Matthew chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. And now as John dis John's disciples were leaving, Jesus began to affirm John's ministry by asking some rhetorical questions. This is a question you don't really expect an answer to. You know, you already know the answer. John had a passionate message and he shared it with firm conviction. He was no reed swayed by the wind and he was not a man dressed in fine clothes. So sometimes people go like, you know, what is it you're expecting to see? I was on a radio broadcast, and you can go listen to that broadcast. It's on my page, on uh, the Tina, on all of our Facebook pages. I, and then you can go to uh, Jesus Saves Ministries with uh, Angela Lee, with uh, Minister Angela Lee Price. Um, and that broadcast is on there. And she was saying like, you know what, when people go to church, you know, it seems like they're looking for something. You know, they want to go behind the popular pastors or somebody with a big name or they want to, see someone in a suit or certain dressed a certain kind of way or the choir singing certain songs. What, you know, aren't we supposed to be seeking God, right? We want to hear the word of God. We want to worship God. I don't care what you have. Well, you might care what you have on, but you understand as long as it's not a distraction. Amen. We just want to hear a word from the Lord and we want to give him glory. Amen. Matthew chapter 11, verses 9 through 12. Greatest in the kingdom. I'll go to NIV. No, let's just stay with King James. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, Among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that it is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. And we were talking about that a little bit at the beginning, because they brought it up in the beginning. You know, he says, Jesus confirmed that John was a prophet, but more than an ordinary prophet. He was the one whose ministry was foretold in Malachi chapter one, verse, I mean chapter three, verse one. John's assignment from God was to prepare the way before Jesus. That is to call people to repentance in anticipation of Jesus coming to usher in the kingdom of God. Jesus had the, I mean, yeah, Jesus had the highest regard for John the Baptist, but he used the occasion of this meeting with John's disciples to direct attention to God's kingdom. To be a part of this kingdom should be our highest aspiration in life. The whole purpose of John's ministry was to direct others to the kingdom of God. Entering into the kingdom is God's desire and will for each person. It is a success far greater than anything else we could ever hope to achieve. Scholars differ in opinion about how the kingdom of heaven has been subjected to violence and how violent people have been raiding it. And then we go back to what we were talking about in the beginning, where it said one opinion is that the violent raiding referred to persecution of John the Baptist Jesus and others who would announce the kingdom's arrival. The power of the kingdom of God provokes a violent reaction in those who oppose it. So that's what we were saying in the, begin in, in the beginning when they were referring to this verse, um, the violent taken by forces that on the one hand, people will be running to get a word from the Lord, you know, like the blind men and everybody just running to try to get a word, get a touch from Jesus to experience the kingdom of God, to accept him as their Lord and Savior because they believe that he was the son of God who died for our sins and rose from the dead and he is seated on the right hand of the Father making advocacy and intercession on our behalf. And now we are filled with his Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, the same spirit that rose Jesus from the dead is dwelling within us, giving us power to breathe and to live and to move and to have our being, <clears throat> excuse me, and to accomplish great feats every day for the kingdom of God and people will come against that when you stand up for justice and righteousness people <clears throat> excuse me will come against us they will not want to change their ways you know there's remember there are sermons that we have taught on from John you know that third John I think it is or 
it's like where it says, you know, there's God's people and there are the devil's children. There are people who really are on assignment. Definitely the world, if they, you know, for people who don't come to God, that are on assignment from the evil one, just as we are on assignment from God to, to try to destroy us, to destroy God's purpose, to defeat his purpose. Thank God for keeping us and giving us wisdom to know, you know, to, to know to come to him, to know how to stand our ground, to know when to talk and when to be quiet, you know, thank him for his fruit of the spirit, but it's going to be opposition that's going to come against us. Just like we're seeing in the streets where people are protesting and then some people are looting. Are we see people that are being unjustly martyred and killed just for walking down the street with a drink in a bag, you know, just, you know, the people's self-interest or people's ignorance or people's biases or the evil one enters them and they lose all, sanity or compassion or reason and so i thank god for the lessons on wisdom so he makes it clear that he expects us to be able to think and that's why we are the kind of creature that we are because we are able to think and we are able to have compassion and we are able to reason and we don't have to be violent amen unless that becomes the only choice so matthew 11 verses 13 through 19 proving wisdom right for all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, and if you are willing to accept it, this is NIV, he is the Elijah who was to come. Whoever has ears, let them hear. To what can I compare this generation? They are like children sitting in the marketplaces, marketplaces and calling out to others. We played the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. John's ministry culminated the time during which the prophets and the law had pointed to God's coming kingdom. John was the final Elijah, the consummate prophet spoken of earlier in verse 10. Jesus' call to hear what he was saying required going deep to wrestle with the life-changing implications of what he, what had been said. Now remember, at least for Solid Foundation Church of God, one of the, less, the, the sermons we were um, led to preach was talking about looking for the message in the parables, looking for the message that God, not just saying, wow, what a great preacher or a great teacher, or wow, what an interesting story. What is God trying to say to us? What is the application to our lives on how we should live, what, how we should be thinking, what we should, what should be coming out of our mouths, how we should be treating one another what is the message amen what is the implication for our lives if we say we are christian people and we accept that we have a master that god you know savior jesus and so that's who we we answer to that's who we uh whose example that we follow and and internalize right we become like him we become christ-like so what implications come with that i mean what conclusions what consequences what does that mean for our lives amen and so he's saying like if all these things are true then what implications you know you know when jesus says listen listen you know then what does what is he trying to tell us what does that mean for our lives um Verses 16 and 17 demonstrate how the Bible does at times does at times indicate that its characters and cultures possessed a sense of humor. The fact that many in Jesus' day had nothing but criticism to offer in response to God's message and messengers showed that nothing ever satisfied them. They weren't happy when they should have been happy or sad when they should have been sad. When we are in tune with God's priorities, we care about the things God cares about. John the Baptist's choice of diet was not expensive by any means. He effectively lived off the land by eating locusts and wild honey, Matthew 3, 4. Apparently, some people thought him to be possessed by a demon because of his unusual lifestyle. Jesus spent, Jesus spent time eating and fellowshipping with people who were looked down upon others. Remember, he said that's who he came for. The rest of the people were already on the right track. So, you, you know, you, they already were on the right track. He came to seek what was lost, the ones who 
didn't know for sure. The ones who were hungry and thirsty, and technically it's really everybody still looking. We don't know everything. We still seek. We still knock, right? At least I know I do. And I want to know more and more of Jesus. And I want to know more and more of God. I know you do too. Amen. So we seek him. He came to seek those that were lost. And thank God, you know, believers are no longer lost. We know the way. Jesus is the way. The word of God provides a way. Amen. But we don't look down on Jesus trying to lift up others. Amen. We want everyone to be saved. We want other people to accept his offer of salvation. Amen. That's the only way things will ever be better is if everybody's on the same page as much as possible about what's right and what's wrong. Amen. And treat each other as such. Amen. Even when it conflicts with our own self-interest, you know, we might not get everything we're wanting or get it our way because we may have to sometimes humble ourselves. Amen. So it says, that, you know, people said he had a demon in him. John the Baptist, because he wasn't eating and, you know, stayed to himself a lot, you know, just preached. And then they said that Jesus, you know, look at him. He's a glutton. He's a friend of sinners, you know, thank God, because he wouldn't be our friend, would he? And it says, so he said, Jesus said, wisdom is proved right by her deeds. In other words, time would validate the truth of the message preached by both John and Jesus. This message contained true wisdom from God, and it would change the lives of those who received and applied it for the good now and eternally. And so a moment with God says, John the Baptist knew Jesus for himself. He called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world in John chapter 1 verse 29. What are we supposed to do with such information? We are to have hope, to be confident. Remember every lesson, that word, golly, confidence. Confidence in what you're believing and where you're headed and how life will go. Amen. We have to have that kind of godly confidence, you know, not arrogance, you know, in our own power or what, you know, our own plans per se, but in God's promises that we're going to be okay in this. Amen. Uh, so to be confident that God is doing something magnificent. We ought to take heart because God is rolling out his grand project to right what is wrong, to save what is lost, and to restore what is ruined, not only in us, but throughout the sin-weary world. If we want to live in a way that acknowledges the reign of Jesus, we must relate to the world the way Jesus did, with no resentment, <clears throat> excuse me, no bitterness, no grudges, no fears, and no excuses. We must see ourselves as part of the healing force. We are ambassadors for Christ. We do things the way he would do them if he was here, like he was manifested in the flesh. We are his ambassadors. So we have the same attitudes. We grow in Christ. We mature. We get the fruit of the spirit. We get the virtues. We use our gifting, our calling. We become more and more like Christ. Christ. Amen. Yes. We decrease so he can increase. Yes. We want to be like Jesus. We are the healing force, not the troublemakers, not the e children of the evil one, but we are the healing force and we have joy. Amen. We're going to have some joy. We're going to find some fun things. We're going to find things to smile about. We're going to have confidence in our hearts. That's going to give us joy. No matter how bad things look, we have confidence in that prayer will change things. We go to God believing that he's going to change it, that he's going to give his peace. He's going to provide protection. And we play the role that we're meant to play in this life and in this world. And we trust that he will send others where we are, where it's not our responsibility or where we can't do anything, then he will send others. And if, if not others, he himself will intervene. But his plan will be done and we give him glory. Amen. We are not resentful. We are not bitter. We do not hold grudges. We are not afraid on, except for the fear of the Lord. Amen. We're believing that we respect him. And so we keep ourselves in check. Amen. Because we do respect God. But we don't fear man. We, and I understand it's a work in progress, you know. We've been conditioned sometimes to feel fear when you stand up or when you speak against wrongdoing or when you speak for change. You've been conditioned, amen, to be afraid. But God, he, he did not give us a spirit of fear, did he? He gave us power and love and a sound mind, you know, self-control. So we pray for an increase of those things, of the fruit of the spirit, and to have wisdom and to have strength and to see the power of God move in our lives. 
and we don't make excuses. We just know we got a way to go. Amen. So we must see ourselves as a healing force and our transformed lives will be evidence that the kingdom is launched and Jesus is revealed as the one. And that's from our Pathways Daily Devotional Guide. Amen. So when Jesus said, some people are not happy no matter what you do. And that's the truth. You know, so some people are people pleasers. And so they're just running like, you know, like a little ant, just running back and forth. You know, I was just trying to get the attaboys or a pat on the back from somebody. And then the next day you feel just as bad because you really have to have that peace and confidence within yourself. Because no matter what you do, so, you know, if you're around enough people, somebody will find something wrong or have a criticism. And so you have to have that godly confidence that if you're doing what God would have you to do, or if I'm doing, you know, I'm living the best life I know how to live and believe in God to bring me along, or my parents, or my mentors, you know, God uses whoever, or, or even life experience, whatever it takes, Jesus, whatever it takes God to bring me along. But from day to day and moment to moment, I've got peace. You know, even no matter what somebody else is saying, you know, I, I, I might have to consider it. But if I know I'm doing the best, I know I'm doing you know, I'm doing right. Leave me alone. You know, get the behind me. Satan, stop. You know, life is hard enough. I don't really need people to be always complaining or making problems where there are none. Find you some joy. Amen. So just be careful when you're listening to other people because sometimes some people just are never going to be happy or satisfied. And that's just a sign of immaturity or not knowing God. And that's not, it shouldn't be us. And we shouldn't be shaken by that. And it's unfortunate that they said that about John and Jesus, you know, because they just were looking for something to say, weren't they? That's what people do. You know, people say, you're too dark, you're too light, you're too tall, you're too short, you're too fat, you're too thin. Whatever you are, it's not going to change it, you know. It's like, just leave me alone. I got you. I heard you. You know, God's going to make a way. So in our application, it says, my college roommate once told me that his home church required anyone who wished to serve in leadership in the congregation to spend a year volunteering for regular duty cleaning the restrooms at the church. We used to have to do that at church I used to go to, <clears throat> excuse me, because we couldn't afford to pay anybody to do it. So everybody took turns doing it. We cleaned up. And I mean, we just humbled ourselves and that's what we did. We loved our, our place to work. We loved having a place to worship. We wanted it to be clean. Amen. We wanted to uh, not people not to get sick. So we did it ourselves. And it was the leadership that took turns, actually. It wasn't the people of God. I mean, they could have helped and they all did. And whoever volunteered did have something to do. Um, definitely, but definitely it was the leadership that cleaned the bathrooms and cleaned the sanctuary and, you know, did the out, cut the grass, everything. And we just did that. Amen. We didn't think it was beneath us. And so it says this church is saying everybody that wanted to be in leadership had to spend a year doing regular duty cleaning the restrooms. This was to be sure each, that such persons truly had a heart to serve and were not just seeking a position of church leadership because of some kind of power trip or the desire to be noticed by others. When have you known someone who was content to serve behind the scenes, perhaps taking care of the church facility or making other arrangements in support of the congregation's weekly gatherings? So how many people do you know? Like, I enjoy, you know, they enjoy cleaning or, you know, even serving meals or whatever. They don't have to be up front all the time. They enjoy that. Why did this person prefer such a role as opposed to being formally appointed to a board or a committee? What difference did his or her service make to the ministry of the church? It's, I mean, it's invaluable, isn't it? When somebody, you don't have to argue or, you know, getting, or people feelings getting hurt or people being insulted. Somebody says, no. I remember I was head of women's ministry at a church. And I thought, if you know, if you came to my house, you said, wow, you got flowers and all these things. But I, for some reason, I'm just not that person. <laughs> Usually, you know, in a public place that I even bake, I bring the cookies. But, you know, I prefer someone else to you know, that likes to do the hospitality part of it, you know, put the flowers. And I was, I was just surprised at how many people really enjoyed doing that. They would tell me, you know, after the, if we had a special program, they would say, you just go home and we, we're going to even clean up. You know, I praise the Lord for people like that, that are really called to the hospitality, you know, part of the, of the kingdom. They just love putting the flowers out and making the table so beautiful or greeting the people and making sure, you know, that the people are comfortable and, you know, and the cleaning up of everything and the food is good and things like that. It's just wonderful when people don't think those things are beneath them. 
you know, it, you know, especially if the leader, they understand that, you know, at least in my position, there was a lot of studying, a lot of putting together of those programs or those lessons. And it seems like that congregation really understood, you know, and they all chipped in and did the other things and that people might think were not so glorious or whatever. But I was thanking God, thinking they were wonderful. Thank God for people like them. So behind the scenes, people are priceless. We have a lot of behind the scenes people right now. People are saying it's the year of the, the season of the no name people, the people who are su showing support to people who are actually out in those streets protesting or people who are, you know, in authority. It's the people giving them advice and wisdom and support behind the scenes that helps them to be able to stand up every day. And I pray to God that they, you know, are grateful for the support staff that they have. I mean, because I don't know how you could do it all. And so, they're saying, why would those people want to do that? Because they're called to that and they're gifted for that. So I don't think, I don't know about you, but I don't think any job in the church is beneath me. Amen. I'll do whatever God wants me to do. And I believe that if he wants me to do it, I'll do it well, even if people don't praise us, right? Because they were saying in our apply, you know, what if people don't praise you? Well, God is going to give you glory. You're getting the glory of God. Everything we do we do it unto excellence, unto God and not for men, because a lot of times they're not going to be grateful and they're not going to express gratitude. And actually, like the verse we were reading before, you might suffer violence. You know, you can go and help people out and do it for free and everything, but they still can come against you. They did that to Jesus, didn't they? It's like he was just there to help. And they talked about him like a dog and they plotted to kill him and they killed him. So that's the way it goes. I don't want us to be killed and martyred, you know, unless it's a part of God's plan. But, you know, I even talked about our feelings hurt, especially amongst the people of God. But I found it to be common. People get jealous. People are immature. People are out of position, you know, and they just don't see themselves. And so that's why God tells us to, you know, kind of confront and call people on it. But unfortunately, a lot of times people are too afraid to do that. And so the mess keeps going and we stay in prayer. Amen. <laughs> Okay, I live. Let's finish this up. There is an old saying that goes, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Politicians in particular seem to have difficulty grasping this concept. There is another saying most likely adapted from the thoughts of writer and philosopher George Santayana that goes, those who do not learn history are doomed to repeat it. When the author of Ecclesiastes wrote, There is nothing new under the sun, he was stating a powerful piece of truth. As Jesus said, wisdom is indeed validated by the things we do. When we are open to acquiring new knowledge and skills and learning from past mistakes, the benefits are multiplied beyond us to those around us. Perhaps you serve on a church board, teach a, group, a Bible study group, manage other employees at your place of work, or serve in some other kind of formal, formal leadership role. Even if you simply attend church or are managed by someone else at work, God can bless others through the wisdom he gives you. They will hear it in your words and see it in your actions. As with John the Baptist, it can prepare people to receive the kingdom of God, the best and wisest gift anyone can get so even though everybody's not comfortable in leadership you still are technically a leader if you have you know as a christian person because we can we can teach by our example or if we are a leader you know we teach what we know to other people <clears throat> excuse me so that they don't have to make the same mistakes or that they can build on what we know amen and so this is god can bless others through the wisdom that he gives us and that means that we share it with other people and so that's our lesson for this week. Make sure you join us for next week. And our song today, I'm going to try to sing it. I hope I know the words. Uh, and it's a song I usually don't sing because people sing it at funerals or I hear it so much. <clears throat> Excuse me, but I'm going to try to sing a little bit of it today. Why do I feel discouraged? And why should the shadows and why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home when Jesus is my portion 
our constant friend is he his eye is on the sparrow and i know he watches me i sing because i'm happy and i sing because i'm free his eye is on the sparrow and i know he watches he watches me and you all can go on then. Some people will speed it up. I sing, I sing because I'm happy. And I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know, and we know, thank God we know, he watches over me you be blessed now the day i'm recording this is the fourth of july weekend so you be safe and you be blessed and you find joy in the lord this weekend amen amen